All right, good afternoon. Not all of us made it through lunch and back again, but thank you for those of you that did. Um, it's good to be back together. And this last session will be much more specifically about our work in Albania. We've talked sort of theoretically about why we do missions and some practical things about how we send missionaries. And now I'd like to share with you a little bit about what we do in Albania. And there are sort of two sides to why share this. One is that the local church here is one of our sending agents. So we do this on your behalf. We are sent by you. Um, and so we're, re we're reporting to you what we do, what you've sent us to do, what you're part of, and so that you can pray more dynamically, be more part of, of the team, be more partners with us in the ministry. And then also I think it's important that we, we report and we build in our churches a sense of what is it that missionaries do? It's hard to recruit the next generation of missionaries when we have a vague idea of there are people that go out there and do weird and possible things. But actually a lot of what missionaries do is the hard daily work of like doing stuff here. And so just sharing with you, this is, this is one example. Every missionary's ministry life, everything is individual, unique to them. Um, but there's also a lot of, of similarities. And so to, to be able to share that and say that this is one example and those who are called to missions will do things like this. So first of all, I, I wanna say that we're sent by the Orthodox Christian Mission Center and we're very grateful that this sending agency has developed. Um, as I said in the earlier presentation, my, my focus today really isn't presenting the Mission Center, but say it is very, very important that we as a church in North America do have a mission center. It's one of the only places that all of us as Orthodox in North America actually work together on something. And that's, that's wonderful. And it's wonderful that we have the blessing of the Council of Bishops to do this, that this work is blessed and is under, under the, the care of the bishops. I also want to mention that we do work as part of a broader team in Albania, both under the Church of Albania. We work in the Albanian Autocephalous Orthodox Church. Um, so everything we do is under the direction of Archbishop Anastasios with his blessing. Um, I won't try to explain broadly the whole ministry of the church there because that would take much too long. We also work as part of a, a group of missionaries that are sent by the Orthodox Christian Mission Center to Albania. Um, some of the other missionaries there are on the screen. Um, I won't talk a lot about their ministries either, just because just to briefly outline what we do will take as much of the afternoon as you want to spend. Um, but just I don't want to give the impression as I talk that we're the only people out there doing anything just because I focus on what we're doing. Um, so uh, feel free to look up the McDonald's, the Ritzies, the Bendos on the OCMC website, learn more about them, be in contact with them if you want to learn more about that work. So I want to talk about the historical background a little bit of, in Albania, and I want to, to suggest to you that we have a historic window of opportunity right now in Albania. Um, because of the, the historic situation that I'll explain to you, I believe that the next decade in Albania is very critical for what the next generation, really the next century of orthodoxy in Albania and even beyond will look like. So as we think as a church, we have limited resources, we're investing in some places, how are we gonna do this? I believe that Albania is one of those strategic points of investment right now. So starting out, where is Albania? So it's in the Balkans, just sort of north and west of Greece there. Um, this map also shows Albanian population. This is not the vision of the greater Albania, it's just where Albanians happen to live in the orange color. And um, so we see that there are actually Albanian population in some of the neighboring countries as well. Um, borders in the Balkans are very difficult and political things. You can never find a map that pleases everybody, but this is, this is from National Geographic and it's just lifted from there for just the basic geographical um, idea. So these are mosaics that are found in this little chapel in this second century Roman amphitheater in Albania. And we start here to remind ourselves that 
Christianity has very, very deep roots in Albania. The gospel was preached by the end of the first century there. This chapel and these mosaics are there remembering, commemorating the martyrs of the amphitheater in the second and third century in Albania. The bishop that was already serving in Duras in this city by the end of the first century was martyred. So we have a very, very deep Christian history in Albania. And if you go around this, the country, you'll see baptistries, cathedrals, all sorts of Christian ruins, many, many paleo-Christian sites, many monasteries. And the thing that these have in common is that they're Christian and that they're ruins. And they are tributes to the deep roots of Christianity in Albania, going back to the first century, extending for almost two millennia now, but also for the fact that Albania has suffered tremendous persecution through these many decades, especially in the, the last five centuries. In the center of Tirana, there's a mosque. This reminds us of the Ottoman occupation for almost 500 years. The guy on the horse in front there, his name is Skander Bey. He is an Albanian national hero, and he led the Albanians in the 15th century in resisting the Ottoman occupation of the Balkans. And it may be partially due to his work that we don't speak Turkish today in all, you know, throughout Europe and other places around the world, that he helped um, the Christian West stand against the Ottoman Turkish invasion. But eventually they did conquer Albania and during almost five centuries of occupation, about 70% of people in Albania converted to Islam under constant pressure over centuries. There were of course those who kept faith. Saint Cosma is one of the important figures of this century. Often he's thought of primarily as a Greek saint and that was of course his ethnicity, but in his time, there weren't the borders that there now are in the Balkans, and a lot of his life and work was actually in the region that is Albania today, and helping people under the Ottoman persecution to maintain their Orthodox Christian faith through the founding of schools, through preaching the gospel. He was eventually martyred and buried where this chapel was later built near this river. That, was, that building was actually completely, or almost completely buried during the time of the communist persecution and has been excavated since then. The 20th century brought a lot of changes in Albania with the end of the Ottoman presence in Albania in 1912 with two Balkan wars, World War I, a very chaotic and difficult interwar period in Albania, lots of different transitions in governments. The church became autocephalous, self-governing in Albania in 1937. And then in 1939, the Italians invaded Albania, and that was the beginning of World War II for them, with foreign occupation. A very, very difficult time under the Italians and then the Germans in World War II. Then the war came to an end, freedom came to Europe, it was time to rebuild again, and the harshest, most repressive communist regime in all of all of the Eastern European countries came to power in Albania in 1945. And during that time, from 45 to 67, they persecuted religion, persecuted the, the Orthodox Church as well as all other religions. In 1967, they became the first country in world history to officially outlaw all religion. You know, the other systems in, West, in Eastern Europe, according to their constitutions, they only had freedom of religion. According to their practice, sometimes it was persecuted, often persecuted, sometimes severely. In Albania, it was a, officially an atheist regime where there was no freedom of religion. All belief and practice were illegal. During this time, all of the church properties were confiscated. All of the clergy were forced to stop serving and all of the bishops of the church died. So it's believed that about 1,600 churches were destroyed during this epoch. Um, nobody really knows for sure, there's not adequate records, but a mass destruction of churches and churches that weren't destroyed were converted for other uses into things like animal sheds, storage facilities, army barracks. During this time, again, there were those who secretly kept faith in very difficult conditions. One of these was Pompeiani, who's now a priest in our church, um, one of the first ordained after the persecution. During the persecution, he was a metal worker. He worked in a factory and secretly 
at great risk to himself, he would make crosses. And these are very tiny, about, about that big, these crosses that he would make. He would take those and place them in places like destroyed churches, or other places that somebody might come to pray secretly, that they would be able to find a token that would remind them that other people were still keeping faith. So Gabriella actually grew up in Albania during this time. And so, come on. So she's going to come up and share a little bit with you about her experience actually growing up in Albania during the atheist regime there. I was born during communism. I was born during communism, and um, when I was growing up, I didn't know there was a God. I didn't know there was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I didn't know that the Father had sent His Son into the world to save me. I, I didn't know, although I came from an Orthodox family. Um, my parents grew up, they were teens during uh, the time of the persecution of the church, so they didn't learn much about their faith, and they couldn't share much with me. But even of that knowledge they could have, they couldn't share it with me because I was a child and I couldn't be trusted. I could go outside and share it with other people. And then uh, if they were found that they were uh, keeping faith, then they would be persecuted. They'd be sent to prison. Sometimes people were even killed. So um, my parents couldn't share anything with me, but God was still finding ways to work in me. Um, I remember that um, as a six or seven years old, as I would look out into the creation and I would see the world, I wondered how it all came to be. What sustained it? And is there a God? And if there is a God, how does it look like? And I remember thinking about that, but that wasn't sufficient for my transformation. I went back to doing my own thing. And um, Uh, when I was growing up, my, both my grandfathers, I never met them. They died before I was born. My, uh, mother's, my father's mother, she died when I was around five, so I don't have a lot of memories with her. So she couldn't teach me the faith. And my mother's mother that lived longer than the rest, she lived far away from us. And um, also, again, she couldn't share that with me because I was a child and I was going to go and, and say it out there. So, but I remember during that time, during communism, my mom one time, she went and visited my grandmother together with my sister. And when she came home, she brought red eggs. And for us kids, that was such an exciting thing, but we didn't know what it was. And we said, where'd you find those? And she said, that's how the chickens that grandmothers made them. And she saw that that wouldn't fly with us. And then she told us the truth, that they had celebrated Easter secretly at my grandmother's. That now, I didn't know what Easter was. I had no clue. It was just one of the words that I heard. And um, also, there was not a, a single church existing. There was not a single building. I actually didn't even know that we had a church in my village because the church in my village was turned into an animal stable during communism. So they didn't have a, a, a church celebration, but they, they had a, a celebration of a meal for Easter. And so, and she told us that after we were done eating the eggs, we were to burn the shells because we couldn't throw them outside. Um, there were spies everywhere. So th that's what we did. We didn't want something bad to happen to our parents. And, um, but that wasn't meaningful for my life. And after the fall of communism, I remember my first experience of going to church. Uh, they, they cleaned the animal stable and returned it into a church. It was. Um, very badly kept in poor conditions, but they tried to do the best they could. And we had a, a priest that had survived communism. He was very old and in bad health, but um, he um, held the service for Easter, the first service, Easter service that I attended. And um, there were a lot of people in church that day, and I was one of them, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to behave. I didn't know what to say. I, I, have no, I had no idea. And people were talking with each other because they also didn't know what to do. I was trying to absorb everything I could, although I didn't know how to behave. Uh, but that was a, a first experience. And then um, after that, 
as I said, the priest was in very bad health, so he couldn't continue to teach or do um, catechisms and try to bring people in, in faith. But um, I don't know how. I think it is through the evangelical missionaries that were in Albania. They had passed out some uh, books for um, children. And one of them was on the life of John the Baptist, and the other one was on the life of uh, Jesus. And I read those books, and I was so touched by God's love for me. He had sent his son to save me. And at the end of those books, it said to pray. I didn't know how to pray, but I couldn't stay without talking to this God that loved me so much. So I remember praying. I remember it being a wonderful experience, but uh, I, I don't remember what I said. So, and then after that, some Catholic nuns came in the area, and they were doing catechism. So all the kids went there, and I was one of them. So I started learning Bible stories through them. And my parents had a very strong identity of being Orthodox, so they would always remind me, you can go to the Catholic Church, but remember, you are Orthodox. So, um, and I never received communion in the Catholic Church, but I, I learned about faith through them, and I, I was so grateful. God used so many different people to bring me uh, to him. And I am grateful for the contribution of each one of them. And um, I think so during this time, I started learning more about the faith. And then after that, the, the Orthodox Church was more mobilized, and they started sending seminary students into villages where they were doing intense catechisms, and then they would have mass baptisms. So the, a group of seminarians come to my village, and they are doing catechism, so I attended them. And during this time, I had the opportunity to see, compare, and contrast between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. And that was the, the time when I made the Orthodox faith my own faith and not my parents' faith. And, and I decided to become Orthodox, and I was baptized. And then um, at, through baptism, I entered the church, and I, I started attending church every Sunday and became part of the youth movement of the church. We would meet every uh, Sunday after liturgy and we'd have uh, teaching times together. And uh, one of the things that we did as, as youth was summer camps. So I remember going the first time at summer camp. And there was the opportunity for me to live life as a Christian from morning till evening. I had no idea how to do that before. Uh, but there, I, I could see you start the day with a prayer, and you pray before meals, and you praise the Lord for the food he has provided. I had the chance to uh, have my first confession. Father, Father Luke Veronis and his wife, Presbytera uh, Faith, were the ones that were leading the camp. So um, one other thing at that time at camp that it touched me was Father Luke's and Faith's um, example, their love and their commitment and their dedication to Christ. When I looked at them, I said to myself, I want to become like them. And it, it happened that the um, camp was at the facility of our seminary. Our seminary is uh, grad, undergrad level. So, and I was a junior in high school then. And um, God used a friend to show me that he was calling me to the seminary. So I started praying about that, and then after I graduated from high school and received my parents' blessings, I went to the seminary, and I had an opportunity to learn more about the faith, to be shaped more about um, from other people that were more experienced in the faith, and um, also come to understand that God used other people to bring me to him, and now it's my turn to allow him to use me to bring other people to him. And this is my prayer to this day. Thank you, Gabriella. So that's a, a little window into life growing up under communism and the process that began of sharing the faith in Albania and rebuilding this church. So. 1991 brought tremendous change in Albania with the collapse of the communist system. It was the last of the communist system to fall. The door swung open. Albanians tried to escape the prison that they'd been held in for all of these years. And Archbishop Anastasios was sent by the Ecumenical Patriarchate to Albania, initially just as an exarch, as a representative, to find out what was left of the church. 
after this time of persecution, after this time where there was almost no communication in or out. And so the archbishop began immediately to look around and see what he could find, and what he found were things like this. Now you can look at that and you can tell it once was a church, but sort of bits and pieces, ruins, remnants, nothing in terms of organized structure, nothing in terms of existing liturgical life. So the archbishop began immediately the process of rebuilding the church. It's the rebuilding at the seminary where I teach now. We'll see just a little bit more about that in a minute. Then some other church buildings around the country, the, the properties began a process of being returned to their original owners. And so the church was able to get back some of the properties that had been nationalized, but they'd all been abused or used for other things. There was a tremendous investment in restoring those. Some of the ancient churches actually still had their iconography, although they'd been used for other things. There's a meticulous process of restoration. And this is a very important thing. In some ways you'd say, why invest in that? Well, historically this is very important for the Albanians because it helps them to see that their true heritage isn't communist atheism. It isn't even Islam that goes back for 500 years. But for many centuries before that, their identity was Orthodox Christians that is still witnessed to by the walls of these churches that has, have survived all these years. Then we also have many newly built churches. Um, so this is the cathedral in Tirana that's a, a wonderful new church. Um, it's amazing in many ways. It is the cathedral of the resurrection and it stands in the center of the city just a few blocks from the parliament building where they passed that law in 1967, where they decided that God doesn't exist and we outlaw him forever. And now they don't exist and the Cathedral of the Resurrection stands in the, in the center of the city. And so if you add up the numbers there of the, the new churches, the renovated churches and the repaired churches, well over 300 churches back in service now in Albania, which is an amazing achievement, an amazing effort, all this rebuilding and the Archbishop has done incredible things in gathering funds and, and leading this this incredible work of rebuilding but of course this in many ways is the easy part the hard part is rebuilding the faith in people's lives if you have enough money you can build a building but actually transforming the hearts and lives of people as we said early is the work of the Holy Spirit is in an effort of years and so immediately, as Gabriella mentioned, there was a process of beginning to send out catechists and people into villages um, as clergy were trained of doing baptisms. Often there were baptisms of a hundred and more people in a village in one day. Um, of course, this was just the beginning of Christian life for these people. There was need for a lot more catechism and training after that. <coughs> Re-establishing the clergy was extremely important. Just a handful of clergy had survived. They were all in extreme old age and um, in very bad health. So the Archbishop re-established in 1992 the seminary that made it possible for um, the training of clergy. Initial training was very limited, but the, the school has grown now to on a, a full four-year program. And in 1998, the Synod of the Orthodox Church was reestablished, giving the church its full character as an autocephalous church. Um, it had been in a unique situation with just the Archbishop up to that point. We have had the joy of seeing the consecration of, we now have eight bishops in the Synod. Two of them were consecrated as Metropolitans about a year ago. And these two young men are, are very dear to our hearts. They were um, actually students at the seminary when I first went to Albania. So I had the privilege of being their teacher, now seeing them grow and develop and reach this point of where they're actually metropolitans in our church. So this is a little bit of the, the background of where Albania has come from. Albania is now in this time of transition, moving from a communist past towards a yet undefined future. The question is, what is that going to be? What is the future of Albania going to look like? In so many ways, the West is flooding in and all of the influences, economic, intellectual, 
cultural, materialist of Western Europe flooding into Albania and drawing it to be part of the post-Christian Western materialism of Western Europe. 70% of Albanians self-identify as Muslims. And as so, there's the possibility for Albania to swing towards the east. At this point, most of them are very nominal in their Islam. They don't practice Islam in any significant way. But it wouldn't take a lot for that to shift back and for Albania to be a very Islamic country. But right now we have incredible freedom in Albania under inspired leadership to continue with rebuilding, to continue with this miraculous resurrection. And so we, we ask you to stand with us, pray with us. We need more people. Um, and that'll become evident even more, I think, in some of the other things I'll share. But it's a historic window of opportunity. It is much more challenging than it was 10 years ago. The, the worldview of people was wide open to anything immediately after the fall of communism. Now, the concrete is beginning to harden, and the future is becoming more set. But right now, we still have a tremendous time of opportunity. So what do we do in Albania? Well, we're part of a very, very small mission team working to, to rebuild the church there. And as such, it's important that we work strategically. We work to have the maximum input with the resources we have. And so we try to work in strategic areas to inspire, train, and equip Albanians to evangelize their nation and disciple their people. So we try to seek strategic ways in which we work with people first to inspire them so that they're willing to commit their lives to this work, train them so that they have the abilities, and then equip them so that they have the tools to be able to do this work so that they, multiplying our efforts, can do evangelism and discipleship to reach as many people as possible in Albania. So some of our areas of ministry, um, I teach at the Resurrection of Christ Theological Academy. We'll go through a list here real quick and then have some pictures of each one of these. Together, we direct the Central Children's Office of the Orthodox Church of Albania. We also direct ministry with adolescents connected with the Children's Office, lead ministry with parents. We work in Kosovo, and there's a whole story with that that we probably won't have time to tell, but um, we'll show a couple pictures and you can ask questions if you're interested. And then I have the privilege of also representing the Orthodox Church of Albania on an international level in a number of venues. So a few pictures of our work at the, the seminary, an excursion, some downtime, some classroom time. Our seminary is a four-year um, undergraduate level school. We're working towards academic accreditation, which hasn't happened yet. I teach patrology, which is the, the early church fathers. We'd ask you to pray for the whole work of the seminary. Imagine in this place where Orthodox tradition was uprooted, systematically torn out of people's lives for more than a generation. And now we have the opportunity to replant that. If we plant the tradition well, it can flourish and grow it can be then passed on to generation after generation. If the tradition, however, is reestablished in a distorted or unhealthy way, that will be multiplied and passed down. And so the work at the seminary right now is critical. Most of our teachers now are young Albanians that have been trained and are prepared to do this work, and it's a joy to work together with them. But ask, please, Pray for us in this work. We wouldn't just form people academically, that we wouldn't just teach them how to do services, but that they would genuinely learn to pray and become theologians, that they would be people that truly have the treasure of orthodoxy in their hearts that they can pass on to others in turn. Then we have the, the privilege of leading this other group of ministries. We do this together with a team of young Albanians, a staff of around 12, sometimes we have a few more, a few less, as people have different stages in lives. And these are people that we really pour our lives into, inspiring, training, and equipping them, raising their capacity so that they can be successful in ministry, doing much more than just the two of us could do on our own. So we'll just share a little bit about some of the areas of ministry with this. 
Um, we do ministry at the cathedral. We have a children's program each Sunday following liturgy that lasts about an hour and a half to two hours and a time of Christian formation, catechism, but also fun and um, human formation of children. We have the program that goes all the way from toddlers through, through the end of high school. Um, then we also have ministries at a number of the other small churches around Tirana. You know, here, normally, a group of people gathers and forms a church community, and then they work over time to build a building. Um, in Albania, because of the unique situation where the buildings were destroyed, the Archbishop has rebuilt buildings, and now we have the work of gathering communities to those buildings. So in these small new churches, um, we've gone out into the neighborhoods, um, met children, built relationships with them, invited them to children's programs. Initially, these programs are, are not religious in nature because we have to build relationships with them in order to eventually, over time, lead them to Christ. And um, beautiful things that, that we see happening, but, but very challenging to not just run programs, but actually organize programs that foster relationships in order to draw kids actually, not just to participate in programs, but to actually grow closer to Christ in his church. We also have ministry in, in several locations where there aren't yet churches, and I want to share with you a little bit about one of those. This is in a neighborhood north of Tirana. It's a neighborhood called Bathora, and it has around 100,000 people, most of whom have emigrated from northern Albania, from the high mountains, and are now settled in this northern area just north of the capital. We began work there in 2006 in the home of Cristo, was a young married person at that point who had found Orthodox faith in Greece when he was working there as a laborer through um, different connections with some, some Orthodox families there. He'd come to faith, then moved back to Albania with his family, and they opened up their home for us to be able to begin doing um, a camp, a summer camp, and then a kids club in their home. But not too long after that, Cristo was diagnosed with cancer. And it was one of those questions you ask God, oh God, why, 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 why him? Why this person in this place? Um, so, but Christo was very intent on walking through his cancer as a Christian and really living out his Christian life. You need to understand that in Albania, Death is dealt with very much at arm's reach. People often don't even admit to loved ones. Loved ones are not even told when they're, when they're critically or terminally ill. Um, death is denied till the very end because under communism it was a system where there was no hope and you had to deny until the end. Then death comes and, um, and then there's deep, deep despair. Most of you know of the story of my wife, Lynette, who was diagnosed with cancer in 2004 and eventually fell asleep in the Lord in 2006. But her story was really an in inspiration to Christo that her life, the end of her life, was lived out not in despair, but in triumph. Um, and she, uh, we came back to the States for a period and during which she received medical treatment when there wasn't really any more hope through medicine, we returned to Albania, and even just two weeks before her death, Lynette was able to give a talk at one of the camps, talking about a Christian end to our lives, painless, blameless, and peaceful. And her, her funeral was, was really a celebration of the resurrection. And Christo took that with all of the other things that he had learned and really set his vision on, on being a testimony and was a wonderful, wonderful testimony to this this area, and in a way that nothing else could, his hope in the face of death gave a testimony to this region that has helped this work in his neighborhood grow. There's much more that could be told about, about him and his family for the sake of time, we'll move on. But so we're in the process of seeing a church being born there. There's about 50 people that come to liturgy once a month celebrated there. There's weekly programs for children for women um, and for families there that um, 
on an ongoing basis. It's not a church yet, but we're hoping and praying over time to become uh, a permanent church community. One of the things that we've seen strongly over the course of our ministry is the importance of working with families. Initially, our mandate from the Archbishop was to work with children, to build children's programs, and we did that, but what we saw is children grew up and grew through the children's program. When the children's program was done, church was done for them, and they moved on to the rest of their lives. And so we saw that it's really important to develop programs where we reach out to the whole family. So often, it's much easier for us to, to connect with the children. We reach out, build relationships with children, but then through them with their parents and with their families. This is a lot more time intensive and challenging for us and for our staff than just doing the children's programs, but we believe that it will um, really be the best way towards long-term transformation in these families. We also, as a result of this, have a parents program that's part of our weekly program at the cathedral. These are some of the parents from that program. We see it's important not just to do on-site, at church programs, but also to do activities where they go out and live normal life together, do things together, celebrate together, learn to live that Eucharistic life that we talked about that's not just coming to the altar and not just coming to communion, but experiencing all of life as life in God. Work with adolescents also grew out of the ministry with children. Um, so as kids, originally we had the mandate through 13 years old, but then what to do with the older kids and the Archbishop asked us to de develop a program for high schoolers. This is an area in which we need further growth. Um, I think high schoolers are a challenging age anywhere, anytime. Um, and so we, we really would ask your prayers for, for further growth in this ministry that we would find better and more dynamic ways to reach out to the high school students. Puppet theater is another one of our tools. Um, we have a puppet theater that does two productions each year and then goes around to many of the remote villages, about 30 different shows for each of those productions. And it's a great tool that we tell the Bible stories with and build bridges with, with kids. Um, as Gabrielle already mentioned, camping is important. I lead the summer camp for boys um, 10 to 13 years old each summer. Um, we spend a lot of time first training the leaders, but then also developing and doing the, the camps. I believe that camps are only ever as, as good as the leadership is, as good as the group leaders, because that's where the really important relationships are built. So camps tend to be a little bit noisy with 90, 10 to 13 year old boys for 10 days, but they're, they're great experiences. As Gabriella shared, this is a time for many of these kids that grow up in homes, even if they're of Orthodox background where they have essentially no Christian practice in their home at this point. Their parents grew up in a completely atheist society with no religious influence. And so trying to give them some of the rhythms and practices of Christian life, of prayer, of scripture reading. We try to organize the camp not just in a way of we do camp stuff and then you go home and it's all over, but where they develop rhythms of Orthodox Christian life that they can con continue at home. One of the exciting parts of camp is always the, one of the last days we do baptisms of boys that um, weren't baptized when they come to camp. Um, at the beginning we ask who would be interested in doing catechism and preparing for baptism. We encourage them, only the ones that, that really want to make a commitment to following Christ to go through with this and with baptism and always with the, the blessing of their families. Family camps is another way that we've developed to reach out to build transformationally into the lives of families. Um, we've often had visitors that have come and help us to organize these camps. Um, and this is a time again where families are able to come together. We do teaching for adults, teaching on age appropriate levels for the children, and then also family activities, everybody together. Helping these families to gain a vision for what Orthodox Christian life as a family could look like. Because remember again, None of the parents grew up in a Christian home. None of the parents grew up in a place where faith was practiced because it was simply impossible. And so they are trying to reinvent the wheel, as it were. Our work in Kosovo is a whole other story in itself. These are teacher trainings that we've done the last several years that are part of a broader 
um, relationship that grew out of the war, the conflict in 1999. Um, some will remember that conflict. For some of us, that's too many wars ago for us to remember. But during that conflict that was ostensibly a conflict between um, Orthodox and Muslim, and Orthodox Serbs and Muslim Albanians, um, we ended up with hundreds of thousands of Muslim Albanian refugees in Albania. We were able to build relationships with them in a really unique way and then continue to serve them as they went back. Um, for many years, we've done camps in some of the Muslim Albanian villages in Kosovo. And these are, are camps that are not religious camps at all. They're part of the social work of our church, but where we are able to go in as representatives of the Orthodox Church of Albania and minister to, the, to these children, helping them um, transcend the trauma of the war helping them build citizenship skills and these sorts of things. Um, then we've also been able to do teacher trainings where we help the teachers raise their capacity to be better teachers. And also it's a venue where we're able to build deeper relationships with them. So I also have the privilege of representing the Orthodox Church of Albania in a number of other venues. Um, I represent the church where you know, we're a small, fledgling church in so many ways in, in this process of rebirth, but also have um, responsibilities of the other autocephalous churches. So I represent the Orthodox Church of Albania in the official dialogue with the Roman Catholic Church, with the Lutheran World Federation. I'm also on the board of World Vision in Albania and the, the Interconfessional Bible Society. Um, so this is some of the work we do in Albania. This is some of the work that you send us to do. It's um, work that we feel very blessed to do. It was a very quick outline. I think we still have a little bit of time for, for some questions, anything you'd like to know more about what we do or what you'd um, like to, to ask um, for more information about. But thank you again for your participation today. So do we have any questions, thoughts? Good question for you. You grew up in a missionary home, family at Columbia. At some point in time, you became Orthodox. Okay. And did did you have missionary work as as your career path before and immediately after that, or can you tell us about what was going on with you at that time? Sure. Um, so yeah, so I had the wonderful privilege of of growing up in Colombia. And I returned, my parents, because of the Civil War in Columbia, were back in the United States for a period of time while I was in high school. They have continued since then the work in Columbia. Um, so and during high school, I was thinking about college and things and what I was going to do with my life and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I appreciated what my parents did. I thought it was fine. But um, I decided that probably what was, wasn't what I was going to do. I decided I was going to do something important. Um, I didn't know what that was, but it was going to be important. And um, went off to college, um, was at Wheaton College in the Chicago area. And I started trying to figure out what that important thing was going to be, what I was going to major in. And I thought about this, this one life I have and, um, and how I was going to spend it. And what I would be happy to say at the end of life, wow, I'm glad I spent it on that, not something else. I saw lots of people that were rich and traded their lives for money and weren't very happy with that. Um, so eventually through a long process, I came back around to saying, you know, sharing Christ with those who wouldn't hear otherwise, who wouldn't know otherwise, that might be worth it. That might be important. Um, so, but at that same point where I was sort of coming on this circle to, to say that really, I think, I think missions is what God is calling me to, I started through studying church history to discover this whole part of the church that was before 1500, um, and especially the very earliest part of the church. I um, was very fascinated with that, um, and was very, became very interested in the sacraments. I actually was, was really intrigued by the sacraments through my study of the Reformation. When I learned that all of the major fathers of the Reformation, like Lutheran and Calvin, actually believed that God was doing something in the sacraments. 
they discussed and argued amongst themselves, and I wondered why they argued so much about something so unimportant as the sacraments, because in the tradition I grew up in, it was just representational. Um, so that led me to really understand the sacraments in a sacramental way, as the early church did, but also to start attending a community in downtown Chicago that was struggling with some of these things as well. And through that, I also was introduced to the idea of apostolic succession, that not just the church had sacraments, but that there actually had been a structure of the church from the beginning, that the, the church was this organic relationship of bishops in communion with one another and in communion throughout the generations. And we as a community decided we wanna, we wanna join that. And so through a other long process, um, we became All Saints Orthodox Church in Chicago. Um, that's now pastored by Father Pat Reardon. Um, so one of the challenges, though, as we became Orthodox was the fact that, and at this time I was, I was married to Lynette as well, um, we had the sense of calling to mission, but we couldn't find anybody within the Orthodox Church that could tell us anything about missions. Whenever I met Orthodox people, I was, you know, okay, tell me about the missionary work of your church. And there wasn't an OCMC yet, and nobody really could tell us much. Um, but through a long process, we actually eventually did become Orthodox and find the mission center, and um, God has blessed that. Sorry, that's kind of a long answer to a short question, but. Any other questions? I was just curious about, um, I guess, the restoration or the advancement of Islam in Albania now at this point. How, do, you know, historically we know it was advanced through military conquest, but what, are they doing anything, you know, actively now to bring it back to Albania? Definitely. There is a great deal of investment from the Islamic world. Um, they would very, very much like to have Albania as a European country, as part of the Islamic world again. Um, so there's this 70% of the population that says they're, they're Muslim. Most of them are completely non-practicing though, but the Islamic world has invested, built hundreds and hundreds of mosques, um, educational facilities. Now, there's a very visible Islamic presence. Right now they're building a very, very large Islamic mosque center right in the center of Tirana. Um, so, by God's grace, we still have a lot of freedom, and um, there is a tradition in Albania stretching back quite a while to the, the sort of renaissance of Albanian national identity, where Albanians emphasize religious harmony. Um, in earlier times, they felt like different great powers tried to pull them apart with religion, said no, we're gonna be Albanian first and religious second, which is wonderful when it brings harmony, but when your first religion is your nationality and your second religion is your faith, it's hard to build deeply transformed Orthodox Christians either. So, um, so our, our main thing is to take advantage of the window of opportunity we have now. And there are, there are people that we encounter that are very committed to their Islamic faith, but the vast majority of people are not. Um, and we see people frequently coming to Christ, um, being baptized in the church from Islamic backgrounds. So I don't have a very clear question, so I'll kind of just spew out my thoughts. Um, I grew up as a Protestant, and um, my idea of mission work is you feel a desire to be a missionary, you go and be a missionary, you have a clear message of the gospel, take it um, and go with it. And as a young person, I, I definitely felt that desire. Um, coming to orthodoxy, it's definitely been on the back burner of my mind, but it's not very clear then what a missionary is in the orthodox church. It feels as if somebody is... Um, I guess because of, of authority and, and uh, our hierarchs, um, it feels like somebody is, is placed somewhere, like the bishop would place you um, in a certain region of the world. Um, but it sounds like that might not be kind of how missionaries work. So if, if an Orthodox person is interested in missionary work long term, how would they, um, how would they do that? Um, again, it's not a very clear question, but uh, just... Um, 
I'm not sure how somebody would become a missionary is, uh -huh. is all in my ignorance. So all right, if you great, can great question. That. Thank you for that. Um, so lots of different threads there. Um, one to say that, that there is a tendency when people come to orthodoxy from evangelical backgrounds to find this lack of emphasis on missions and to think that that is a lack of theological importance for missions in orthodoxy. Um, it's not, uh, you know, as Archbishop Anastasios has very clearly demonstrated in his, his work and the work of others as well, it's for historical reasons a lack of practice in recent times. So that basic imperative to missions is still there. You know, John Chris Hossum said, I don't believe in the salvation of anyone that doesn't try to save others. You know, that's pretty blunt. Um, and whether that's the person next to you or the people a long way away that don't have anybody at all to witness to them, that's, that's our imperative. Um, we need to do a better job of forming our Orthodox Christian young people to understand that. But then the very important question is, okay, I'm on board on that, what do I do next? It is true that, that we don't, in Orthodoxy, we don't have the sort of Wild West entrepreneurial approach to missions that I want to go and I'm going to go wherever I feel I can do whatever I want. We have the canonical structures of the church um, that sometimes our bishops have a lot of work to do to negotiate those between themselves and figure them out, but our church has canonical structures and we have the blessing in North America of having the OCMC which is an umbrella organization of all of the canonical Orthodox working together. And so that provides this great way of proceeding towards that work. And so by, by going and um, beginning the application process, and it, begins, it can be, begin very simply with you know, a phone call or an email. You can go to the OCMC website, ocmc.org, and, um, you know, call up Deacon James or write him an email and say, I'm interested, and it just starts as a conversation. Um, you know, uh, no commitment on either side. It starts as a conversation, a conversation that grows over time. And then if, if you really feel like that's something you want to pursue, um, there's an application process, there's visits to the mission center, um, you know, different testing and, and different things that happens. And then as the official representative of the canonical bishops in North America, the OCMC then enters into a process of discernment with other bishops around the world. So they don't ever just send somebody somewhere. It's always in a process of discernment with other bishops. Nobody ever comes to Albania without the specific blessing of Archbishop Anastasios. So they would come and work under him in Albania or all of the other fields in which we work in Guatemala and Africa. So there's always that process of the OCMC as the official orthodox structure in North America with the blessing of the bishops being an interface. And then, then for those that are being sent, you know, orthodoxy does have a hierarchical structure, but also it has the strong principle of, of personal freedom. And so there's always a conversation of this is where the needs are, this is what your talents, train, training, abilities, you know, desires are, how do we come together and prayerfully discern how that should happen and where this person should be placed in order to be successful? You know, there's, there's nothing gained if we place somebody in a ministry that we can't foster their success in. So that's an even longer conversation, but um, that's a basic idea. Well, that's about going to conclude our time. I want to really thank you, Nathan and, and Gabriella, for flying out from Chicago, you know, sitting in airports and coming to see us. And you've been inspiring, and we appreciate hearing your perspective and just sharing your lives with us. I think we've all gained quite a bit from, from your presence here, and we, we, we're privileged to be able to support you and your partner up with you in your efforts. Um, so it's wonderful having you with us. Now, you'll be also speaking to our, our younger group tomorrow after Divine Liturgy. So rally the kids to um, spend a little time with, with Nathan and Gabriella at that time. And this will uh, conclude our session. Thank you very much. 
and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you again to all of you for spending your day with us.